The Commander X16 modern retro computer has been getting a lot of attention lately. Much of this attention comes from would-be game developers who would like to get started on the platform. This is wonderful and is really what the Commander X16 is all about, making 8-bit computing accessible on real hardware. However, a lot of people have been confused and discouraged when it comes to creating their first game, especially when it comes to running a game with 65 CO2 assembly. One thing to keep in mind is this. Assembly language isn't hard, it's tedious. There is nothing confusing or complicated about any of the 65CO2's instructions, nor any of the addressing modes they use. In fact, the complete documentation for each instruction could fit on a piece of paper the size of a post-it note, and that's for all addressing modes of the instruction. And there's really not that many instructions. Compare this to something like a modern JavaScript framework library like React or Angular, where there are pages and pages of documentation on the various ways to bind, pass, and display data. And that's without bringing in the common libraries for URL routing, HTTP requests, and state management that you'll also inevitably have to learn. By comparison, 6.5 CO2 assembly is downright easy. That said, the initial project setup can be daunting to newcomers who have never coded an assembly project. In this video, I hope to demystify the initial setup for a Commander X16 project. In my previous video, I walked through how to write a simple Hello World project using the Commander X16's built-in assembly environment, Codex. It might be a good idea to go back and watch that video first, but it's not required if you don't want to. While Codex is a powerful tool, it is not ideal for a modern programmer who has access to a more modern computer. I doubt any serious games will be written in Codex, at least not until some improvements can be made. For most developers, writing a game on a modern desktop or laptop is probably how it will be done. So to begin with, let's recreate the Hello World program from my last video, but use my Linux desktop instead. If you have a Windows computer or a Mac, you should still be able to set up things exactly as I do. The only dependencies you need are the CC65 compiler suite, the GNU Make utility, and a text editor. You should be able to find builds of all of these tools for Windows, Mac, and Linux. I use Vim as my text editor, but you can use whatever you're comfortable with. It really doesn't matter. Open a text editor and create a main.asm file. Immediately, we come to the first hurdle of 6.5 CO2 assembly. We need to tell the assembler a few things about the memory layout of the executable, and doing so requires a dark incantation that is both confusing and indecipherable to newcomers. This is required because of the default configuration for the Commander X16 that comes with CC65. If you stick with me, I swear that this is the worst of it. It's just unfortunate that this particular hurdle comes up so early. Just type exactly what I do and you'll be fine. I'll explain it as best I can. We need to use the .org assembler macro to specify where in memory our code is going to live. Due to the default configuration of the CC65 assembler, you will need to use 080D. This can be changed, but you'd have to supply your own Commander X16 configuration for the assembler instead of using the one that comes with CC65. Next, we need to define some segments that the Commander X16 assembler configuration expects us to define. For this, we use the dot segment macro. Using all capital letters, add a startup segment, an init segment, a once segment, and a code segment. Make sure your code segment is specified last, since that's the segment we want our code to be assembled into. With that out of the way, we're ready to start with some more understandable coding. Like in the Codex video, we are going to be using some of the kernel routines from the X16's ROM, so we should define their addresses as symbols to keep our code readable. We need to define the screen routine at address FF5F and BSOUT at address FFD2. We define a main label where our code will begin, but we also define an end label where we can jump to exit the program and return to basic. Under this end label, we will add an RTS or return subroutine instruction. 
At this point, we could assemble and run our program, but it wouldn't do anything except return to basic immediately. We'll wait until we have more code before we bother with calling the assembler. The first thing we want to do is to change to screen mode 3 using the screen routine. Underneath the main label, load a 3 into the A register using immediate mode. Then we can jump subroutine to the symbol for screen we defined earlier. After that, we initialize the X register with a 0 to use as our loop counter. The LDX routine in immediate mode makes this easy. Now let's define the text we want to print to the screen. We can put this right before the end label, since we only ever plan on hitting that label by branching directly to it. We can define the bytes that make up our string by adding a label and using the dot literal assembler macro. We put the text in quotes followed by a comma and a zero. This is how we create a C style zero terminated string. Finally, we need to write our print loop. Above the string literal, create a label that we will be branching to during every iteration of the loop. Like in the last video, I named this print loop. The first thing we do in the loop is read the string label offset by the current value in the X register. This is done with a load A instruction in the absolute indexed by X addressing mode. If the value read was zero, meaning we have finished printing the string, the Z flag will be set and we can branch directly to the end label. This is done with the branch equal instruction. From this point on, we know that we are still printing the string, so we use jump subroutine to call the BS out kernel routine. Then we increment the X register with I and X, and we branch unconditionally back to the start of the loop. Now that our Hello World assembly code is all written, we need to assemble it into machine code. When I did this in Codex, there was no assembly step. The editor converted what I was typing into machine code immediately, putting it into the correct place in memory on the Commander X16. Here on my Linux desktop, I need to assemble it into a file that will then be loaded into memory on the Commander X16. To assemble my source code, I'm going to use the CL65 utility from the CC65 project. This is a command line program that can call a C compiler, an assembler, and a linker all in one step. I won't need the C compiler at all, and for this example, I'm not using the linker either. However, CL65 is probably the best if your application is ever going to link to other libraries or allocate memory for variables. From a terminal in the same directory as my source code, I type out the CL65 command. I pass it a dash T flag followed by CX16. This tells the assembler to use the Commander X16 configuration that comes with CC65. I follow that with a dash O followed by the name I want to give my program. I call mine hello.prg, but name yours whatever you like. Just remember to use all caps so that you can type it from basic on the X16. Finally, I pass main.asm, which is the file that contains my source code. Now if I list the directory, I can see that hello.prg has been created. To run this program, I could start the emulator and load it from file with a basic load command, and then execute it with run. However, I prefer to start the emulator with my program already loaded. To do this, run the commander x16 with the dash prg argument, followed by the name of your assembled program file. I also prefer to use the dash run flag so that my program starts as soon as the emulator boots. Because my monitor is so large, I also like to scale the emulator by 2 with the dash scale flag. I press enter, and the emulator runs my program. This is great and all, but I'd hardly call it a convenient development workflow. Every time I make a change in my editor, I need to retype the assembler command and the emulator command in order to see the changes. For a modern developer working on a modern computer, this feels slow and clunky. To help solve this problem, I'm going to set up a makefile. A lot of programmers start to feel anxiety when they hear the word makefile, but there's no reason for it, at least not in this case. While some makefiles and the build systems that create makefiles are complicated, confusing, and arcane, the makefiles for building a Commander X16 project are simple and straightforward. There's no reason to fear them. I reopen my editor, and I create a new file named makefile, with a capital M. 
This is what the GNU make utility expects a make file to be named. For now, we are going to hard code everything, but we can come back later and make this more generic. Make files work by defining a number of targets. These are just files that the make utility is supposed to create when called. Our simple program has only a single file that we want to create, hello.prg. So first, I type hello.prg in the first column to indicate that this file is a make target. I follow it with a colon, and after the colon, I list all the files that this target is dependent on. Since our program is built from a single source file, I just list main.asm after the colon. The way make works is that it checks for the existence and the last modified timestamp of each target. If the target file doesn't exist, make knows that it needs to run the code under the target in order to create it. If it exists but its timestamp is earlier than the timestamp of any of its dependencies, it also knows it needs to run the code. If the target exists and its timestamp is later than all its dependencies, then make knows that it does not need to bother rebuilding the target. This is how make runs only the steps necessary to build the target. Our project is dead simple, so there's only one step to turn the one source file into the one make target. If our source file changes, make will run this target and rebuild hello.prg. All we need to do is tell the target how to build it. For that, we just retyped the CL65 command that we used to build from the command line. Make sure to place it under the target and indent it. If we save the make file and go back to the terminal, we can now run make hello.prg and our target will rebuild, if we've changed the source code that is. However, I'd prefer to just type make and have it build. To do that, we need to set up a default make target. The easiest way to do this is to create an all target in the make file. This is a special target name that runs when make is run without specifying a target. But we don't want to just copy our hello.prg target. We instead just need to list hello.prg as a dependency of all. Now when make tries to build the all target, it will see that either hello.prg doesn't exist or that it is out of date with the changes in its dependencies and build it. Like before, nothing will be rebuilt if nothing has changed, but now we just need to type make. Building is one thing, but when we are developing a program, we want to frequently run it to see our changes in action. Much like the all target, we can create a run target. This time we list all as its dependency, because we obviously need to build the program before we run it. The command that this target will execute is just the commander x16 emulator command we typed at the command line earlier. Now when we make a change, all we need to type is make run, and our program is reassembled and executed on the emulator. Lastly, every good makefile has a target that cleans up after itself. Our only build artifact is the hello.prg file, so let's create a clean target that deletes that file. This target has no dependencies and simply runs rm-f hello.prg to delete the file without asking the user if it's what they really want to do. We can now clean our project with make clean and reassemble and run with make run. If you're like me, you'll probably set up hotkeys in your editor that run these commands automatically so you don't have to drop to a command line and type it out. It makes for very quick turnaround times for testing changes. Now that we have a decent development environment, we can go back into our source code, make a change, and see that change in our program with very little effort. In my next video, I'm going to run through how to turn this simple Hello World project into the skeleton code for an actual Commander X16 game. Thanks for watching and stay tuned.